All right, Robert Breaker here, and welcome to the Cloud Church. Uh, today's sermon is on a subject that uh, several people have written to me and asked me to talk about, and that is this, this subject of prayer, or how to pray. Uh, a lot of people, and I'm getting feedback and getting emails and phone calls and letters from all over the world. I'm just so surprised how many people all over the world are contacting me and saying, boy, your, your videos are a blessing. Your sermons really help me in the Lord. And so lately there's been some people saying, well, can you, can you do a video on how to pray? And, you know, I, I had this on my list here of, of things I want to preach about, but uh, it was kind of lower farther down on the list, and so I just went ahead and put it up at the top and just feel like this is what the Lord would have me to preach today, is on the subject of prayer, what the Bible says about how to pray. What is prayer? Basically, prayer is just talking to God. It's just that simple. Prayer is just speaking to God. And then God speaks to us, not from a voice from heaven like He did way back here in the Old Testament. This, by the way, is the Old Testament. And this, by the way, is the New Testament. It all happened when Jesus died on the cross. That's what started the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, prayer was just speaking to God. And then God could speak to them literally from heaven. He would shout down to them. Well, does God do that now? No, we don't get any vocal shouts from heaven. That's not how God talks to us. Today, God talks to us through the reading of the Word. So prayer is how we talk to God, we who are saved. And reading the Bible is how God speaks to us through His Word. The Bible calls it the more sure word of prophecy, the Bible. Everything that we need, everything that God wants us to know is in the Bible. And that's how God speaks to us. So let's go to Luke chapter 11. In verse 1, this is Jesus Christ here with his early disciples. And the early disciples ask a question. Luke chapter 11, verse 1, And it came to pass that his, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So they said, Lord, can you, can you teach us how to pray? Well, there's a lot of folks that have gotten saved through these videos, and that's a blessing. And I have to remember, you know, the Bible talks about doctrine in the Bible as two different things. You've got the milk and the meat. And milk is the, the basis of, of foundational doctrines, the, 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 the easy stuff, the stuff that you should learn first, like how to pray. And then the meat is the more deep doctrines of the Bible. And boy, I, I love the deep doctrines of the Bible. I love talking about the, the deep stuff. But I have to remember, there's some folks that have just gotten saved and they need the milk. They need the, the basic, uh, easy doctrines of the Bible, the things that you should learn first. So first thing we should learn is how to pray. So I'm going to talk about that today, how to pray. Go to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at basically three different things today. We're going to look at what prayer is. We're going to look at the different kinds of prayers that there are in the Bible. Different kinds of prayers. And then we're going to look at when to pray. And I hope this will be a blessing. Like I said, this is just milk, but I hope it will be a blessing. A lot of people say, well, I know how to pray. So this might be basic, something you've already heard before. But then again, I found some things through doing this study that have been a blessing to me. And so I hope it will be a blessing to others. So Matthew chapter 6. And, and before I get started, let me say, all I want to do is just give you many, many, many Bible verses. And so I'm just going to be going from verse to verse to verse to verse to verse. So I hope you have your Bible and you turn with me to these verses. Because I just feel it's so important to just show the Word of God, what God says about it. I, I don't like the way I talk. I don't like the sound of my voice. So if I'm going to preach, I want to preach what God says and just show you His Word so that he may be glorified. Amen. So let's just look at as many scriptures as possible. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, tell us how not to pray. So before we get into how to pray, let's look at how not to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8 say, and this is Jesus speaking, and he says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Fairly I say unto you, they have their reward. You see, prayer is not something you do so that people can watch you do it and say, Wow, he must be spiritual. Look at him praying. Well, what does this say here? In verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Prayer is something that we do, and we need to do it in a place where we're alone just talking to God. 
Now, there is a place where you can pray in front of others. I've known people that, that they said, I'm just so terrified of praying in front of other people. I've been to churches where before they take up the offering, they say, Brother so-and-so, would you, would you pray for the taking up the offering? And I've known Christians that say, I'm just too scared to pray in front of other people. <laughs> well, you don't have to pray in, other in front of other people, but you don't have to be scared either. Prayer is just talking to God. So, we all need a prayer life as Christians. We all need to get alone with God and pray, is what this verse is saying. Now look at what it says in verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. So there are people that pray for pretense. Verse 5, there are people that pray in public just for show so that people think, wow, he's so spiritual, look at him praying. And they're a bunch of phonies, they're a bunch of hypocrites, is what Jesus called them. And then in verse 7, there are people that pray and they use vain repetitions. In other words, they pray the same thing over and over and over again. There's a certain church, well, there's actually several kinds of churches. They give you a little thing with beads on it. And they say, take this little thing and, and repeat the same thing over and over with each one of those beads. And as you go around those beads, you say the same thing over and over and over. But that's vain repetitions. That's what the heathen did in the time of Jesus. The heathens think, well, God will hear me because I'm saying it over and over and over. Well, if you have children, you know, you don't like that. When your child keeps saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over, you get tired of it. You're like, that, that's enough. So prayer is not a vain repetition. Prayer is not saying something over and over and over. Prayer is basically just speaking and talking to God. So we have how to pray is what Jesus was asked by his disciples and, and he told them. But we also see here in this passage how not to pray. It's not a vain repetition. It's not praying of a little thing with beads and repeating the same thing over and over and over and hoping God hears it. It's simply just conversing, talking to God. So what is prayer? It's speaking to God. And we talk to God in prayer and He talks to us through His Word. So let's start out this teaching about how to pray with the question. And the question is, what is prayer? Now, I've told you prayer is just talking to God, so you say, well, you answered that. Well, I want to go through the scriptures and show you what the Bible says prayer is. And I found there's three things that the Bible tells us that prayer is. So I'm just going to give you some Bible verses. Go to Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 17. And in Isaiah 44, 17, we find some heathen. You know, we just read a verse that says, don't pray like the heathen do. And so we find some heathen doing something. And by the way, the heathen don't pray to God. Who do they pray to? Well, the heathen pray to a false god or to an idol. So here we find someone who's a heathen, a lost person, and he's praying to an idol. And yet we, we can glean something about what this verse says that prayer is. Isaiah 44, 17 says, And the residue thereof he maketh a god. This is the heathen. Even his graven image... Well, that's wrong. The Bible tells us not to make any graven image. And it says there, He falleth down in, unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art thou, my God. So it's a false God, but yet he's praying to it. And what does he do? He falls down on his knees in front of it. That's why often people that, that pray, you see them on their knees praying. But notice what he says, And worshipeth it. Worshipeth it. What is prayer? Well, prayer is worshiping God. So there's nothing wrong with worshiping. What does the word worship mean? You know, I've been in church almost all of my life, and I've only one time ever, ever heard a sermon about what is worship. And a lot of people, they talk about worship. Many churches today, they have a wrong emphasis. You go to the church, they spend most of the church time worshiping rather than studying the Bible. And that's a problem. You can... You can do too much worshiping. What you go to church for is to learn the Word of God, to have preaching and teaching. But what is worship? Well, worship is basically spending time with something else. And, and giving honor and glory and praise to something else. In this case of the verse we read, it was, it was to a false god, an idol. But true prayer to the true God 
is worshiping God. And what is worshiping? It's giving Him time. It's giving Him your time. You're, 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 you're taking time out for Him to speak with Him. Now, if you're married, you understand how important that, uh, that is. If you're married, you have a, a husband or a wife, and it's sweet to just sit down and have conversations and talk with them. And talking to each other is, is nice. It's time to spend time together. Well, that's what prayer is. It's spending time with God, and by doing that, you're worshiping Him. You're taking out time to spend with Him. What else is it? Let's go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. And like I said, I've got lots of verses to go through today, and so I need to hurry. I hope you have a Bible with you, and you can, you can go through them with me as well. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. What is prayer? Daniel 9 3 says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So what did he do? Well, he sought the Lord by prayer. So what is prayer? Well, it's seeking God. So we take time out to spend time with God. That's what prayer is, basically. It's saying, okay, I'm going to seek the face of the Lord in prayer. And by praying, I'm worshiping Him because I'm spending time talking with Him. So prayer is worshiping God. Prayer is seeking God. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Prayer is also something that is, is a privilege. It's a privilege to spend time with God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's another Bible verse that says we come boldly before the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, it's only through that shed blood of Jesus on the cross that we have a right to actually come before God and speak with Him. Have you ever thought about that? Who is God? He's the Creator of all things. He that made the world and everything in it, you can have access to Him and talk to Him anytime you want through the blood of Jesus Christ. So prayer is a privilege, P-R-I-V, I-L-E-D-G, privilege. It is a privilege to be able to approach the creator of the universe. You realize here on earth we have things called presidents and senators and, and so-called government officials. Can you just mark in, march into their office and just sit down and talk to them anytime you want? Well, try. <laughs> You're going to be seriously disappointed if you try to just march right into the White House and sit down and talk to a president. You won't be able to even get in. They have guards out front and they have guns. and they, you, you can't just march in and talk to them anytime you want to. But if you're saved, you can go to the God of glory, the creator of the universe, anytime you want and just say, well, I want to talk to you about this. And the Bible says he'll hear you because it's a privilege to his children if you're saved, that he'll have his ear open and will listen to all those who are saved. Any time of day, God's ear is open and listening to his sons. But notice, the prayer that God hears is only the prayer of those who are saved. John chapter 9 and verse 31 tells us plainly. John 9 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners... What? So if a person's lost and he's a sinner, God won't even listen to that person. So what a privilege it is to be able to come to God in prayer anytime we want because there's some people that can't. So it's a privilege to be able to come to God anytime in prayer because God heareth not sinners. But it says, But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Well, what's the will of God? That you be saved that you obey the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? By trusting Jesus as your Savior, trusting Christ, His finished work, the gospel. So if you trust Jesus, you become a son of God, the Bible says. You're saved. And when you're saved, you can come boldly to the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lost people can't do that. What a privilege. What a privilege to be a son of God and to be saved. Let's go to an Old Testament verse here. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9. Proverbs 28 and verse 9 is an interesting verse. It says, Proverbs 28 9, if I can get there. I've got a big oversized Bible. Sometimes it's hard to find these the pages. Proverbs 28 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. 
Here is an Old Testament verse. This took place way back here under the law in the Old Testament. And it says in that Old Testament time, if a person turned away from the hearing of the law, and yet he tried to pray to God, God says, your prayer is an abomination to me. I hate it. God said, I don't even want to hear from you. You reprobate. But that was back here under the law. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace over here in the New Testament. So think about that. There's not a time ever, if you're a Christian, that God will ever go, no, nah, not going to listen. He's always attentive and waiting to hear from his children. And what a privilege it is to be able to come to God and talk to him about anything. And know that he'll hear us. I wrote a book years ago called The Heresy of the Sinner's Prayer. You can go to uh, my website, rrb3.com, and you can look this book up. I'll go ahead and put it up here. And... Uh, you can read it for free if you want to. You can even buy this book, I guess. <clears throat> Some people have, but I'd rather you read it. If you don't want to buy it, you don't have the money, go read it for free at rrb3.com. But in this book, I showed how there are people today that say, well, if you're lost, all you have to do is say, oh, God, please save me, and he'll save you. Is that, is that Bible? God doesn't listen to the prayer of, of a sinner. God here is not a sinner. How do you get saved? Does prayer save us? today? Well, the Bible says no. The Bible says you're saved by faith. So when you trust the finished work of Jesus Christ, that's when you get saved. The prayer doesn't make you saved. Now, I'm not saying you can't pray. I know many people that prayed when they got saved. But the prayer is not what saved them. Their faith and trust in the gospel is what saved them. But in this book, I have a lot of verses from the Old Testament where we hear verse after verse after verse where God would not hear the prayer of certain people. And so I'm just trying to reiterate the point of what a privilege we have today that when we're saved, God hears us. Because back here in the Old Testament, there was a time when God wouldn't hear certain people. Psalms 18.41, they cried, but there was none to save unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Psalm 66.18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, Proverbs 1, 28 and 29, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 28, 9, He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. I read that verse earlier. Um, Isaiah 1, 15, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make your prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Isaiah 1, 15. And on and on, I could continue on here with, with other verses about that, in which there was a time when God wouldn't even listen to the prayers of certain people. God would not even hear the prayers of a sinner. He said, your prayers are an abomination to me. How great it is to live today in the New Testament. When you trust Christ as your Savior and you're saved, He hears you. And there's never a time when God says, no, nah, I don't want to hear what you have to say. His ears are open and He's always ready to hear from his children. So this is, what, uh, this is what the Bible says. In the Old Testament, there was a time when God would not even hear the prayer of a sinner. And so in the New Testament, prayer is a privilege. It's a privilege for us who are saved that we can come to God at any time, any place, and pray and know that he hears us. So now let's look at the kinds of prayers, all right? This is what prayer is. Let's look at kinds of prayers. A lot of people don't realize that there's different kinds of prayers in the Bible. Prayer is talking to God, but there's different ways to talk to God. There's different ways when you come to God uh, to talk to Him. Sometimes you come asking for things. Sometimes you just come to say, God, I just thank you for this, this, and this. There's other times you come to God and you say, God, help me, strengthen me, I can't make it. And, and it's just talking to God, but there's different ways to talk to God, different kinds of of prayer. So let's look at that. Let's go first of all to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. And like I said, I just want to give as many Bible verses as I can. Uh, I could probably speak up here for two hours on this subject, but I'd like to go quickly and just try to throw it all out there at one time so that there won't be any more questions about prayer and that you might know, okay, now that's what prayer is. So Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
So there's one kind of prayer that the Bible mentions, and it's called supplication. Supplication. What does that mean? Well, it comes from the word there, the root word. The root word is supply. So supplication, basically, is coming to God and asking Him to supply your needs. Or, as we've seen in this verse, the needs of others. So supplication is coming in prayer to God and saying, God, I need this, I need this, please help me with this. Uh, God, would you just meet this need? But notice I said need. <laughs> There's a lot of people today that say, well, all you have to do is pray and God will give you everything you want. Really? No, it, it says need. It doesn't say want. That's the problem with a lot of people today. They want the prosperity gospel. They want to, to tell you that, oh, whenever you pray and ask God for something, He'll give it to you. Uh, no, He won't. You see, He's like... God is like our Father. I had a Father. I'd come to my Father and ask Him for certain things. He'd go, no. Other things I'd come to Him and say, Dad, I need this. He'd say, oh, you need it? Okay. But if I just came to, God, to my Dad and said, well, I want this, I want this, I didn't always get it. Why? Because my Father knew best. Well, when you pray to God, God gave us a promise, and we're going to look at it here in a minute, that He would supply our need. But He never gave us a promise that He would supply our want. There's a lot of things that I want. And I could pray the rest of my life for and I'd never get. Why? Because there's no promise in the Bible that God would give me that. He said He'd give me what I need. But He never said He'd give me what, what I want. Sometimes I'll get it. But not always. Because God knows best. And there might be something that I want that if God gave it to me, it might destroy me. It might make me love it more than Him. It might be something that will mess up my life. So it's best that I don't have it. So it's in His hands. I can pray for it. I can ask for it. But if I don't get it, it's not my fault. And it's not His fault. It's something He looked down and says, I know you might want that, but you don't need it. And I know best. Just trust me. So you don't always get what you want. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says here, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. So by prayer and supplication, we come to God and we make some requests. But that's all they are, is requests. I've heard people preach, well, you have to tell God, I need this and I need it now, and demand God give it to you. Who are you to try to demand something from God? Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that we have that power, that we tell God, you have to give me this, and He gives it to you. God's not an ATM machine. You don't go to Him and say, I demand this and expect Him to give it to you. This verse says it's a request. You come to God humbly, and you say, Lord, I'd, I'd sure like this, I'd sure like that, I'd sure like this, and then you wait on the Lord. And if it's something that's from your heart, and you're not asking out of lust, or, or because you're covetous, and, and you're serving God, and you're doing right, and He sees that, and He wants to, He'll give it to you. But nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God will give you something just because you want it. Matter of fact, look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God will give you everything you want. And yet there are many people that preach that today, the prosperity gospel. Anything you want, God will just dump it on you. Nope, that's not what the Bible teaches. If it's something you need... There's a promise in the Bible that He shall supply it. And that's what supplication is. And supplication is praying and saying, God, meet this need in my life. I need this. And sometimes we pray and think we need something and we don't need it. What is it truly that we need? Let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 8. A lot of times we don't understand that according to God in the Bible, what we think we need isn't what God says we need. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's only two things in the Bible that, that are our need, something that we need. What is that? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So what is this thing that we need? Well, all you really need is food, sustenance to eat so you don't die, and something to wear so you don't walk around naked. Raiment. Clothing. Really, if you have that, you have all you need. Food and clothing is really all you need. And God doesn't promise to give you anything else other than that. That doesn't mean you can't make requests. And that doesn't mean He doesn't answer those requests at times. I mean, it's nice to have shelter. But nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have shelter. 
If you have a house, praise God, you have something, you have a blessing. You, whenever God gives you other things besides food and raiment, that's a blessing. And you should thank God for it. So, two things you need, food and raiment. So we're told in the Bible that God will supply our need, but nowhere does it say He'll supply our want. So what is supplication? Supplication is coming to God and praying, God, please supply this in my life. I make a request that, Lord, that you do this for me and do this for me and do this for me. Don't expect it. If He gives it to you, say, thank you, Lord. If He doesn't, say, well, I guess I didn't need it. I thought it was something I really needed, but I guess it wasn't. But you, not only do we supply our need, we pray for the needs of others. A lot of Christians make the mistake of being nothing more than just outright selfish. And every time they come to God and pray, it's all, Lord, me, 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 take care of me, help me, 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 oh, oh, me, 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 me. That's a selfish person. We read in a verse earlier that it's supplication for your needs, but also for the needs of others. So when we come to prayer to God, we need to realize, all right, Lord, I believe I need this, this, and this. Please, Lord, supply that need. Now, Lord, all these other people I know, please bless so-and-so, please help them, please fill that need over there. You see how it's not all about you, it's about others? So when we come to God in supplication, we can pray for some things we need, but we don't need to be selfish. We don't need to come with a, a heart of covetousness just because we want it. And we need to f not forget others. We need to pray for others as well and for their needs also. So, if you want something, it's not a sin to ask. But don't expect it. Don't think God has to give it to me because He owes me. God owes you nothing. You owe God everything for Him dying on the cross and shedding His blood to save you. And anything else God gives you besides salvation, that's grace. And we're going to see here in a minute that most of your prayer should consist in thanksgiving. That is, most of the time when you go to God to prayer, you should just be down on your knees just going, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't deserve anything. You've given me so much. Oh, thank you, God. That's what your prayer life should be. Because many people here in America, at least, and maybe in other countries of the world, most people are blessed beyond measure compared to, to poor countries where there's not even enough food to eat. You know, I've, I've yet to meet anyone in America in Honduras, in Central America, in Canada, in all the places that I've been in this world, I've yet to meet anyone in these countries that couldn't eat. Even in Honduras, a poor country, I'd go out in the mountains house to house, and I could not find one house that didn't have at least some rice and beans to eat. And they all had clothes on. Their needs were met. They had food and raiment, and they were blessed to have shelter, a place to live in. I've never been to Africa and other countries where they say that kids are walking around naked and their bellies are bloated out with worms and, and they're dying because they don't have food. I've never been to a place like that. Sure, those people need it. But if you try to compare yourself to those poor people that are dying because they're starving to death, you need to realize, wow, I really am blessed. God has supplied my need. So what do we do? We, we supply, supplication, we come to God in prayer. Lord, bless those poor, poor people in Africa. God, help them. Supply their need for food, God. Supply their need for clothing. God, please help them. Take care of them. Get them saved so they don't suffer in this life and then die and go to hell and suffer more. Send them a missionary to get them saved. So supplication is not just praying for us and what we need, but praying for others and what they need as well. Next kind of prayer is second uh, the second one is uh, 1 Timothy 2:1 second Timothy uh, 1 Timothy excuse me 2 and verse 1 and here we have a list of different kinds of prayers and in 1 Timothy 2:1 it says I exhort therefore that first of all supplications supplications prayers what's a prayer just talking to God and then it says intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men so number two is intercessions. What is an intercession? Well, a prayer of intercession is praying on behalf of someone else. You know, there's some people that have certain needs and they don't even know what they need. Or there's some people that claim to be Christians but they're doing something wrong. And they don't realize that. 
And so we come to God on their behalf and say, Lord, please show them the truth. Show them that they're doing wrong. Lord, I just pray for that person that you discipline them and help them to come closer to you. And Lord, I just come to and just, Lord, just help them to do right and show them the need. Show them what the... It, it's praying for others. Well, I thought that was what supplication is. Well, often supplication is praying for the needs of others. But intercession is praying on behalf of another person. God, help that person to do right. So that's what intercession is. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 is an interesting verse. This Old Testament prophet Samuel practiced this, this prayer of intercession a lot. Matter of fact, all the Old Testament prophets seems like they were always trying to intercede. Jeremiah is one of the best on behalf of the nation. Jeremiah prayed and prayed and prayed and said, God, please forgive the sins of my nation. God, my nation is messed up. My nation's bad and I just come to you on their behalf. It's on behalf of others. And he prayed, oh God, please, uh, save my nation of Israel. Jeremiah did. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, Samuel says something that's very interesting. Let me read it to you. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Here we have an Old Testament prophet, Samuel that looked at it as, as sin to not pray for others, not intercede upon their behalf and come to God for them. Isn't that something? How about lost people? There's a lot of lost people in this world that aren't saved, and I like to pray on their behalf. Lord, please send someone to that person to get them saved. Send someone to preach them to the gospel. Lord, do something in their life to make them look for you so they don't die and go to hell. It's praying on the behalf of someone else, and it's it's called intercession. So that's the second kind of prayer. We have supplication, we have intercession. The third one we have is thanksgiving. And I've got several verses for this. You know, in prayer you can just go down on your knees and just start talking to God and just start thanking Him for stuff. Let's go to Nehemiah in the Old Testament 11.17. You see, there's all different types of prayers. And you know, a lot of people know this, but I've known people that have been saved for years that don't. A lot of people that have been saved for years and they, they hardly ever pray. So there's a time when we, we need to pray. We need to set aside time to come to God and talk to Him. Ask Him to supply our needs, but not just ours, but the needs of other Christians. Come to God on behalf of the lost and say, God, please save them. Now, often we need to just come to God and just say, thank you. My dad passed away about five years ago. And he was in the hospital for three days before he finally passed away. And I, I never left his side. I stayed there the whole time. And the last thing I got to say to my dad was, Dad, thank you for all you've ever done for me. And he couldn't talk, but I saw him blink his eyes like this, like he was saying, You're welcome, son. I love you. And you know, that was my father. Well, my heavenly father in heaven. Sometimes I just like to, in prayer, just say, God, thank you for all you've done. And that's what's so important is, is thanksgiving, giving thanks to God. First and foremost for salvation. Nehemiah 11.17 says, And Madaniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabid, Zabdi, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving in prayer. So they all went together in prayer, and what did they do? They gave thanks to God and just said, God, thank you for all this that you've done for us. There's an old song that says, Count Your Blessings. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. And it's an amazing song. It's a good song. It's mostly kids learn it, and, you know, as kids. But when you're feeling down, and you're feeling depressed, and you're suffering, and you're, you know, going through some stuff, and you want to pick yourself up, and you want to be happy, you know what you need to do? Just go to God in thanksgiving, and just thank Him for all He's done for you. Think of ten things, one on each one of your fingers, just ten things that God has done for you. And just start in prayer saying, Lord, thank you for this, thank you for this, thank you for this. And before you get to that, that tenth one, and you really start thinking about what God's done for you, especially when He gave you salvation if you're saved and eternal life, it's hard to be depressed, it's hard to be discouraged. You start thanking God for all that He's done for you, and you know what, it kind of picks you up, it kind of gives you some joy, it kind of goes, wow. Wow, things aren't as bad as I thought they were. God really has done a lot for me. Yeah, it's not a good time right now, but, boy, He's really done a lot for me. So 
So thanksgiving is a part of prayer. Go to Colossians chapter 4. So we need to do that in prayer. We need to thank God for all that He's done for us. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. The Bible says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So thanksgiving is a part of prayer, giving thanks to God for what He's done. Colossians uh, 3.15, I love this verse. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. Now watch the last four, uh, four words. And be ye thankful. You know, that's the problem with a lot of Christians today. They're, they're not thankful. They go around moping, well, I, I should have this, and I should have that, and, and, and then, 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 then things aren't going the way that I want it to. And it, you know what? You're just a baby. You need to stop, get down on your knees, pray, and say, God, thank you for this and this and this. And after a while, when you realize all that God's done for you and all the blessings, you know what? It'll cheer you up, and it'll help you stop moping around. Be thankful. Be thankful. There's so much to be thankful for. All you need to do is just think about it. All the things that God's given you. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So whatever you do, do it with thanksgiving. Be ye thankful. And you can come to God in prayer and give Him thanksgiving and say, Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know what? God likes to hear that. God likes to know that you're thankful. And, you know, more often than not, when you are thankful for what you do have, is one guy goes, You know what? I'm just going to do something good for him because he loves me so much and he's thanking me for all the things that I did do. I'm going to do just a couple more things for him. You see, when you walk around and you're mopey and you're mad and bitter at God and say, well, I don't deserve this and I ought to have this and this, that's usually when God goes, all right, I'm just going to let him suffer a little bit longer until he learns to be thankful. There's a lot of unthankful and ungrateful Christians out there today. Well, there's another one here, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. And number 4, I want to say, promise claiming. You can come to God and claim promises. Do you know there's a lot of promises in the Bible? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. 2 Peter 1 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So there are many great and precious promises that God gave in the Bible. Many are for us. And you know what? You can go in prayer and you can pray. Well, before I was uh, married, I went to the mission field as a missionary with the mark of the beast on me, so to speak. What does that mean? Well, if you're a missionary and you go to the field and you're not married, people say, oh, we can't support a missionary that's not married. So you have the mark of the beast on you, so to speak, because, oh, what will he do if he goes to the mission field and he's not a married man? Oh, he'll probably fall into fornication or adultery. That's the way most preachers think. Well, that's interesting because the Apostle Paul never got married. And he went as a missionary by... It's, it's strange how nowadays people go against the way the Bible's written and what it says. But I went as a missionary and I wasn't married. And I prayed and I prayed and many times in prayer I'd, I'd do some promise claiming. I'd say, Lord, the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. And you said, Lord, you promised that you would make a help meet for me. The Bible says, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with the Lord. So there were many times as a, as a single man on the mission field that I'd go to the Lord in prayer to say, I'm, I'm waiting to find, obtain favor with you <laughs> and find a good thing. I'm waiting for a wife. Lord, you said it's not good for me. And I just start quoting Bible verses to God. Claiming that promise, Lord, you promised that you'd send somebody a help meet for me, for my needs. And He did. I was 31 when I got married. It took a while. Most people nowadays, they get married in their 20s. But a lot of people don't realize there's a Bible verse that said, I would the younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house. In the Bible, God wants them to get married when they're younger. Why? Because the older a woman gets, the more independent she gets. And then if she's more independent and she does get married, then the marriage is going to suffer because she's going to want to say, I don't want to do what he said. I was making a living on my own to do my own thing. No, the woman was created for the man. Used to be, they'd say, you can get married when you're 18 years old. And most people did, right out of high school. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But you know, they used to get married even sooner. My grandmother, I think she died at age 92, my grandmother married my grandfather at the age of 14 years old. They were both farmers. And you know, people today say, oh, that's awful. No, it's not. The Bible says if she reaches the flower of her age, let her marry. What's the flower of a woman's age when, when she starts to menstruate? When is that? Nowadays, it's about 12, 13 years old. Now, I'm not saying a 12 and 13 year old should get married or ought to get married. I'm not saying that. Most 12, 13 year olds today, they, they have a mentality of like a 7 or 8 year old. They've been dumbed down in the secular school system and they don't know. But back in the day of my grandmother, she got married when she was 14 years old. Well, her whole life she was working on a farm. She was disciplined. She, she had the, the, the mind of a 20 something year old because she grew up quick in that environment. And it was the same way in the old days in the Bible. The younger women, 13, 14, 15 years old, got married. Why? Because they had been instructed from a very early age, this is what's expected of you. This is what God wants from you. This is your purpose for being. It's to marry a man and to take care of him and be with him and, and help him. And so they came together with the right attitude to serve the Lord. So there's nothing wrong with that if you're saved, if you're a Christian. But uh, a lot of times we can come to the Lord in prayer and just say, Lord, you know, the Bible says, Delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you the desire of your heart. Lord, my desire of my heart, Lord, is, is to be married to a good Christian woman. And I'd come to the Lord promise claiming and just saying, Lord, your words say this, this, and this. And I'm just praying that you would fulfill your word. So it's not wrong to come to God and quote Bible verses to him. Especially if it's a promise that's to us. So that's another way to come to God in prayer. Now don't be demanding. <laughs> just say, Lord, I'm just trying to remind you of what you said, and I'm just waiting patiently, you know. Uh, I had many prayers like that as a single man. Lord, I'm just waiting patiently. Uh, you promised, you know, not good for me to be alone, so I'm just waiting for a wife. And he sent me one. Well, the last here, the type of prayer, let's go to Romans 12, 12, is, is being instant in prayer. That means always praying. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Instant in prayer. What does that mean? Well, like I said, prayer is talking to God. And you know, there's some people that say, well, you can only talk to God at certain times. Oh, uh, no, no. In the Bible, you can come to God anytime you want and pray. And you need to be instant in prayer. You need to be praying all the time. Now there are certain times when it's good to pray. And we're going to look at that in a second. Over here I'm going to show you when to pray. But we as Christians, we should always remember this privilege that we have of being able to come to God for anything, anytime, in any place. We need to realize when something happens, the first thing on our mind should be, okay, let's pray. Let's pray. That's called instant in prayer. And that's what we need to do. We need to say, okay, let's pray. Let me give you an illustration. Years ago, I was in Bible school, and I went to visit a friend, and I had a big old car. I used to have a 1972 Mercury Marquis four-door. It was gigantic. Got eight miles to the gallon, 429 engine. Oh, I loved that car. It was roomy. It was comfortable. It was wonderful, except for my grandpa taking the air conditioning out. But other than that, it was an awesome car in mint condition, just as green as it could be kind of a pukey green, but it was a nice car. And my friend's house had two gigantic ditches on both sides in a very narrow driveway. And I remember pulling into that driveway when I did, I thought, whoops, my front tire went in and the car was sticking up like that. The back tire was still spinning. I jumped out of my car and my friend, who was in Bible school as well, came out of his house he says, well, what happened? And I said, oh, man, I can't believe this. Uh, look at what happened. I'm such an idiot. What am I going to do? And I just started just having a conniption fit, if you will. And I said, well, my friend says, well, let's pray about it. And I went, what did I think of that? You know, here I am in Bible school. They're teaching me all this stuff. That should have been the first thing on my mind was, well, something happened. Let me pray about it. No, I was thinking, oh, I'm so dumb. I'm such a horrible driver. Well, my friend said, let's pray. So we did. Lord, he said, please send somebody along to help us out of here and just take care of the situation and just help us. Amen. And we're sitting there. All of a sudden, a guy drives by. He goes, oh, you need a lift? He had a 4x4 four four vehicle and a chain. He said, I can just pull you out like that. <laughs> Why wasn't I thinking of prayer first? 
What? What? Wonder why? You see, that's called instant in prayer. The first thing you need to do is whatever happens, is say, okay, we need to pray first. We need to pray first. Um, I heard a story years ago about a Christian man and woman that had a car accident. And they're driving down the road, and there's the Christian man and his Christian wife, and all of a sudden they see a car is right in front of them, and he's slamming on his brakes, and, you know, it's one of those things where everything goes slow motion. And, you know, we're about to hit. And the wife prayed. And in the three, four seconds that they had before they impacted, there wasn't enough time to get the words out. You know, she didn't go, Oh, God, Father in heaven, we become... We come before you, you know, like many people try to pray in public and look all like they're so smart. She only had time to get out two words. So can you picture her in that wreck? And she was instant in prayer. And they're about to hit that other car. And she said, God, us! <laughs> That's the only word she got out. Yeah, I think God understood that. God, us, boom, and they hit. And thank God, you know, it was a lot of damage to the car and everything, but God kept them safe. But what is that? That's called instant in prayer. We should always remember, okay, whatever happens, the first thing I need to do is pray. So let's continue this and finish this up. When do we pray? When should we pray? Well, let's go to Psalm 63 and verse 1. We've looked at a lot today. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Um, a lot of Christians today, they don't pray. Other Christians today, they do pray, and they pray all day long. That's what I do. You know, I, I have a time in the morning when I get up and pray a little bit. But the whole rest of the day, whatever I'm going through, I'll just, I'll just start, Oh, Lord, thank you for this day. And if something happens or whatever, I'm just always continually thinking about the Lord and praying all day long. I try to be instant in prayer. I try. So in Psalm 63 and verse 1, notice what the Bible says. This is David speaking. And look what he says. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in the dry and thirsty land where no water is. So he said, early will I seek thee. So when should we pray? Well, we should probably pray early in the morning. For me, the first time I pray is when I get out of bed. As soon as I get out of the bed, and I'm not a morning person. Oh, I hate mornings. Ever since I was a little child, I've hated mornings. I lived so far away from school as a kid that literally I was the, the first person the bus picked up in the morning and the last person that the bus dumped out in the afternoon. Because I lived at the end of a peninsula and it took the bus driver an, an hour once she picked me up to get to the school. And then once she brought me back it took an hour on the school. So two hours of my day, every day, going to school was just sitting on a school bus. And boy, I hated that. So because of that, I had to get up at, a, at right before 5 in the morning, every morning. And had to be waiting at 5.45 out by the road for the school bus. And our school started at 7.15 in the mornings when I was a kid. I'm pretty sure they don't do that anymore. Well, they start at 8, 9. But anyway, 7.15 till 3.15 in the afternoon. And so every day, two hours on the bus. And boy, I hated that. I hated riding the bus. So I, I've always hated mornings ever since that time because I'd have to get up at right before 5 in the morning every morning. And I remember as a kid, oftentimes I'd get up and I'd go into the bathroom to take a shower and I'd just kind of fall down and lay down and fall back asleep on the, on the bathroom floor. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times my mom would come in, Hey, get going! And, and so uh, I've always hated mornings. I'm not a morning person. But every morning what I do is as soon as I get up, I jump out of bed, I get down on my knees next to the bed. A lot of times I put my head up against the mattress and I just start praying. And that's how I start the day. And that's what the Bible says, early in the morning will I seek thee. When should we pray? Well, it should be the first thing we do when we get out of bed in the morning. We should pray. Uh, we should probably pray right before bed at night too. But here's a Bible verse that says early in the morning. Psalms 5 and verse 3. My mom taught me as a kid before we go into bed. She always read me the Bible and prayed right before I went to bed. That's a great practice as well. Psalms 5 and verse 3, um, we read, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. So, Bible verse. When's a good time to pray? When should we pray? Well, obviously we should pray always, instant in prayer, but we should always set it as a priority. First thing in the morning, we need to pray. When, when should we pray? Well, another one we should pray before we eat. 
that's another time to pray. And what a great opportunity if we do that to show others that we're Christians. Go to 1 Timothy 4. You know, it's always a blessing to me to go out to a restaurant, which is something we don't do often. We don't have enough money to, to go to places like that. They're so expensive nowadays. If, if we do, we, we have to cut coupons. But it's always a blessing if you go out to eat and you look over there and people get their food and the, and the, and the man takes his wife's hand and, and says, okay, let's pray. And you see him pray in public. They don't care what people think. They care what God thinks and they're following the Bible and they want to follow. That's always a blessing to see Christians do that. And what a great testimony of salvation. Well, we've done that ourselves, my wife and I and our kids. Out in public, right before we eat, we pray. And I can tell you, there's been several occasions when someone comes over and says, Hey, I just want to say, I'm a Christian, and I saw you guys praying before you ate. And that's just, that's a blessing, that's an encouragement to me to show that there's still Christians out there. So, it's a great opportunity to pray before you eat and be a testimony to others. But don't do it to be seen of others, of course not. Why do we pray before we eat? Well, 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 says, Well, 1 Timothy, I'm in 2 Timothy. Sorry about that. 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to stay from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So there are certain people that try to forbid you from eating meats. But the Bible says God gave them to be recreate, to, uh, created them to be received with thanksgiving. So when we eat, we sit down and we eat, and we say, Lord, thank you for this. It's called giving of thanks for the food. But look at verse um, 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it re be received with thanksgiving. Once again, you give of thanks before you eat. And then look at verse 5. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So those three verses they talk about, God gave you food, and you should sit down and you should give thanks for the food before you eat it. I usually say, Lord, bless this food to nourish my body. Thank you for it. And uh, bless those that fixed it. And we thank you for this wonderful bounty. Amen. Now, you don't have to pray those same words, but it's wonderful to get in the habit of sitting down and praying and thanking God for the meal. Whether it be breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you can always pray before you eat. So when should we pray? Well, before eating. I just have a couple more and then we'll be done. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. <clears throat> I like studying the Bible. I like reading what it says about, about prayer. Go to Mark chapter 14 and verse 38. Mark 14, 38. Do you pray? Well, if you're a Christian, you have that privilege to come to God anytime you want. And talk to Him about anything. So why not? Why not do it? Mark 14, 38 says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So what does the Bible say about prayer? Well, we should pray when we're tempted, lest ye enter into temptation. So when to pray? When tempted. You see, there's times that because we're still in this sinful, wicked flesh, in which we're tempted to do things. If you can ever get yourself in the habit of, whenever a temptation comes, to just immediately pray, it becomes that much easier to not give in to that temptation. Anytime there's a temptation, your first thought should be, Lord, please don't let me think about this. Lord, please don't let me face this. Lord, please don't let me do something stupid. Lord, I'm tempted to do this thing, but I know it's wrong. And that strengthens you to not do that thing. I like 1 Corinthians 10.13. Go to 1 Corinthians 10.13. I had an email the other day from what appeared to be a, a young teenager, and he says, well, you preach against fornication all the time. He goes, how about preaching a message to help us not to be tempted to do it? Well, the only thing I can think of is this verse right here would be the best verse to use to keep you from temptation. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That is a promise in the Bible. Remember, we looked at promise claiming. This is a promise from God that if a temptation comes, God promised He'll always make a way of escape, so you don't have to give in to that temptation. And all you have to do is just say, Lord. Show me that way of escape. Help me, God, to not do this because I don't want to give in to this temptation. And that's a promise that God will give you a way to escape that you may be able to bear, that you don't have to give in to that temptation. 
So get that mindset of instant prayer. Get that mindset of promise claiming. Get that mindset of, okay, I'm tempted to do something wrong. I'm going to pray and ask God to help me not do it and show me how to get away from it so I don't have to do it. Prayer. Well, one more, one more. When to pray? When to pray, verse, uh, let's go to uh, Psalms 120 and verse 1. We should always pray, not just when we're tempted, but during hard times. You see, sometimes as a Christian, we, we go through some things. We go through trials, we go through tribulations, we go through things, and sometimes it gets hard. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I've been through times in my life when I'm just like, I'd rather die than go through this. Lord, help, help. And He's there, He does. It's not always in, in our time, it's in His time. But sometimes He helps, sometimes he, He's doing it for a reason. He's putting us through something, so we'll learn something. But Psalms 120 and verse 1 says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and He heard me. This is a time of distress. It's a hard time, it's a time of distress. And what should we do? Well, if we're instant in prayer, when hard times come, the first thing we should do is go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help hell. This is called wrestling in prayer. And this is, is sometimes as a Christian when we can get closest to the Lord. Go to Hebrews chapter, excuse me, I don't know why I said Hebrews. Go to Ephesians 6.12. Go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are times when we as Christians, we have to wrestle against spiritual wickedness. Those are the times, hard times, in which we should come to God in prayer and just pray. Sometimes the forces of darkness are against us. We need to come to the Lord in prayer. Matter of fact, there's sometimes when things are so bad that we don't just pray, we also pray and fast. Now, this isn't going to be a message on fasting. Uh, maybe some days I'll... I'll I'll get an opportunity to preach on that. And, you know, you don't have to fast as often as you think. There's some people that fast all the time. There's some people that never did it. But there is a time to fast. And Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21 says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about a, uh, well, up here, uh, some demons. Someone had a demon. I just finished preaching a message here a while back on... Uh, can a Christian be demon-possessed? The answer dogmatically is no, but lost people can. And if you care about lost people and you're praying for them and you're interceding for them, you want to see them saved, they might not get saved because they have a demon. And so the Bible says, This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. There might be a time in your life when you have a mother or a father or a brother or a sister or a cousin and you know they've got a demon and you want so bad to see them saved, you just say, I'm going to fast for a whole week. Drink nothing but juice, a juice fast. I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to fast and just say, God, please save their soul. And maybe God can do something to bring them the truth of the gospel. So this is the different kinds of prayer. This is what prayer is. And this is when to pray. Prayer is worshiping God, seeking God, and it's a privilege. What a privilege we have as saints of God, as Christians, to be able to come to God in prayer. And prayer is also... Something that we can do, but there's different kinds of prayer. There's supplications, intercessions, thanksgiving, promise claiming, and then there's a time we need to be instant in prayer. And then finally, when should we pray? Well, we should obviously pray first thing in the morning, and even at night before we go to bed would be great. We should pray before we eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, when we're tempted, and during those hard times and times of distress is when we should come in prayer. So let me close with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. This will be my closing verse. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The end of all things is at hand. We're very close to the rapture of the church. I believe that. We're in this time the Bible calls apostasy. And the Bible says to watch and pray. The Bible says to watch. Occupy till I come, Jesus said. Can watch for when Jesus is coming. And as you're watching for that coming, that soon coming of Jesus Christ, what should you do? Well, the verse says, watch unto prayer. So this is what the Bible teaches about prayer. I hope it's been a blessing. I hope if you are a Christian that, that you do pray. 
If you didn't know how to pray, I hope this has helped you to show how to pray. If you are a Christian, you pray all the time, maybe this showed you a couple things that you hadn't thought of. You know, maybe you never thought about promise claiming or thanksgiving or praying for others. Maybe you never thought about, hey, I should pray before I eat, or I should pray first thing in the morning, or oh, right before a temptation comes, that should be the first thing in my mind is, Lord, show me that way of escape. I don't know. I don't know your situation. But I do know this. Prayer is important, and it's a privilege and a great opportunity to come to God and talk to Him, and then He talks to us through His, His Word. So please pray for me as I continue preaching the Word of God here on, on thecloudchurch.org, and I will definitely pray for you as I do every day. Pray, Lord, please bless those that watch this, and may it be an encouragement and a blessing to them. And if you're not saved and you've watched this video, you need to come to Jesus. You need to be saved. Salvation is not by a prayer. God doesn't even listen to a sinner's prayer. A sinner can pray and pray and pray, but God says, look, when did you trust me? When did you accept me as your Savior? You see, not what you say that gets you saved. It's whether or not you trust what Jesus did for you. So if you're lost, you need to get saved. You need to come to the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and trust the Gospel so you can be saved. And then you can have this wonderful privilege of coming to God in prayer anytime you desire. So God bless you. I appreciate you watching this. We'll see you next time at the Cloud Church.